Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Learn at Lunch webinar. Today, we will hear from Associate Extension Specialist Roger Saws as he discusses current land values in Oklahoma. If you have questions, please ask them through the chat window by clicking the chat button at the bottom of the screen. For more um, additional information on farm financial management resources, you can visit the eFarm Management page and I'll share that link in the chat box. And Roger will answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Roger, I will turn it over to you now. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation, Brent. Uh, this is uh, an important topic. And uh, so it's time for our annual land value update. And uh, so happy Tuesday to everyone and uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, I'm going to show you some uh, information and some slides that will explore some of the recent trends and patterns uh, and factors driving the land markets in Oklahoma. Uh, we'll talk about what's going on in the farm economy and how that translates into the ability to pay for farm ground. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll give you my two cents worth where we, where at least I feel the, the markets uh, will be headed for the remainder of the year and, uh, and at least in the near term. But I feel that uh, good market information and analysis is really critical, especially to those participants in the land markets and the land transfer markets. But even those of us that are on the sidelines and that are, you know, casual spectators, I, I think it's it's good to have that uh, good information in tow and know where to uh, retrieve it uh, for our benefit and for the benefit of the uh, the publics that we serve. I want to start this off with a uh, field of dreams sort of slide, uh, you know, $13 plus beans and a pretty good yield potential. If you have uh, soybeans that you're growing out there, I hope that uh, it looks something like this as fall. Well. That that would be uh, a, a field of dream for me anyway. So, you know, we've got a lot of real estate to cover, excuse the pun. So uh, let's get started and um, we'll talk about the, uh, the numbers and uh, at least uh, how we drive those numbers in the first place. You know, our land value study is based on actual market sales, sort of a glimpse and a, and a sample of the land transfer market in Oklahoma. It's provided by the farm credit associations uh, around the state. Our average uh, farmland sale last year was about 390,000. Uh, we had over a thousand sales tracks of which to examine. And then in addition to our report, uh, I wanted to mention that the USDA NAS and of course the, the, uh, the Kansas City uh, Federal Reserve Bank also uh, provide reports on land values. Uh, theirs are survey based. And so they uh, survey farmers and bankers in uh, those areas uh, in terms of what those land values are and how much they've changed over the past year. So I think those reports uh, provide an interesting comparison and contrast when exploring the dynamics of the land markets here in Oklahoma, okay? And like I said, I think the, uh, the overall sales volume was down in uh, 2020. I think that really had to do a lot with the, the impact of the, uh, the COVID pandemic on production agriculture, especially in the first half of the year. I think there were a lot of uh, hesitant buyers and sellers out there that really just didn't know how bad the pandemic would be and how it would impact the overall national economy. And then I think uh, later on in the year, especially that uh, last four months or last quarter of the year, I think that uh, we, we saw a sort of a loosening up of the market, so to speak, and at a better participation. Uh, we had higher commodity prices and uh, some stimulus monies uh, from the feds that helped revitalize the land markets. And so that improved farm earnings and uh, strengthened those uh, credit conditions in production agriculture. And I think we had a by far an increased demand for tracts of, of uh, farm ground uh, with a limited supply. And that in itself will drive those markets even higher. So let's uh, talk about the 2020 numbers. And uh, so in 2020, we did see an increase, not a great increase, but a, a steady increase of about 2% for all land in Oklahoma. Uh, and so 
you can compare that with the pasture land uh, components and cropland. Pasture land was uh, very similar. Cropland, we did see some drop off in uh, those values during the, uh, the course of the year. And that's sort of a continuation of uh, several years worth, worth of decline in the, uh, the cropland uh, growing regions of the state, uh, especially since that uh, benchmark here in 2014. Now, I don't know what the, uh, the net income and net farm income, net cash income was in uh, 2020. I suspect it was better than 2019. But in 2019, we do have numbers that uh, just go to show that uh, overall farm earnings really in the state were still way down from where they were in 2014. And uh, so how that translates into the markets, you can kind of see how that plays out. And but I think for 2020, the uh, the farm earnings did improve uh, primarily due to those federal stimulus uh, payments that were available to the ag sector. And so then you can see, OK, so what about the, you know, the difference in direction on the uh, cropland and pasture ground? Um, I have my suspicions that in 2021 uh, that the cropland will sort of close that gap. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in this presentation. So uh, let's move on to sort of the regionals uh, and then the uh, statewide average there of about 2%. Of course, you can see the regionals do vary around the state. And, you know, when you see a statewide average or your, you know, the regionals of where you might be uh, living and uh, farming at, that doesn't necessarily mean that the land parts that you own or operate performed in the same manner. You know, the change in land values is not certainly uniform around the state, Dif difficult to interpret a state average that has so much variability when it comes to land values based on the quality and quantity of land and local supply and demand fundamentals. And uh, so the statewide average or those even those regional average are not necessarily indicative of uh, any one local market. Um, and so if you're thinking about trying to determine the value of a specific parcel in mind, um, either when it comes to sales or purchase, uh, you know, talk to a land broker, talk to, about, uh, talk to uh, some professional farm management firms or a lender that deals in ag finance, a certified uh, ag appraiser. I think they're all very knowledgeable individuals when it comes to those local uh, land markets. Like I said, the, the regional numbers can be quite uh, variable in any given year. This year or last year was no exception. Uh, overall, I think we did see some weakness in the western half of the state, uh, uh, more strength in the eastern uh, portions of the state. And I just wanted to caution you that, um, you know, when we have less than 50 observations of which to examine, uh, like in the East Central and the Panhandle, you have to take those with, a, I would say, a grain of salt. Because in any given year, uh, that average is really impacted a great deal by the land utilization, the size of the tract. And in the case of the panhandle, irrigated tracts, the number of irrigated tracts we have from one year to the next, okay? And then also for a little background, uh, typically about 15% of our sales database is comprised of um, cropland, okay? and. Most of the cropland uh, is found west of I-35, as you might have, might expect. And then about 50% of our sales database is uh, devoted or at least classified as pasture in terms of those tracks. And of those pasture land tracks that we have in our database, we have a lot of smaller ones. Um, about 80% of all the pasture land tracks that we have are less than 200 acres. And then we have about half of those, uh, you know, are less than 100 acres. And so we have a, a lot of uh, smaller tracts found in the eastern portions of the state. And so that's uh, really what's driving that overall statewide average. Uh, the, you know, the crop on parcels are about a quarter section in size on average. You might expect that. And, but their value is not near as high as a lot of those smaller pasture land tracks that are, you know, commonly found in the eastern part of the state. And we just have a lot of those. 
And so that's why that statewide average for pasture is higher than what you might expect. And in fact, in our case, it, it does appear higher than cropland, okay? So that's what's really driving that pasture average for the state and even for some of the regionals around the state. And so this is sort of a different presentation, sort of in a, in a tabular manner. And once again, you can see some weakness in the West since, uh, you know, over the course of uh, 2020. Uh, and then over the last, uh, say, 10 years or so. Uh, I think that uh, the weakness in the, the western half of the state really had to do with the grain markets and those impacts on earnings. We still were seeing a lot of uh, $4 wheat and, um, and the commodities really overall were uh, somewhat disappointing, quite frankly. And uh, we didn't see much help from the energy markets, which traditionally do provide some much uh, needed off-farm income in the western half of the state also. Now there's a good number of uh, pasture land tracts that are purchased for uh, livelihood uh, reasons. They're larger, they really add to the, uh, the cow-calf operation. And so a producer is really thinking about that's our bread and butter, that's our livelihood. So a larger number of, uh, I mean, these tracts of which uh, of, of the pasture land tracts, a larger portion of those are found in the western part of the state. Now in the eastern part of the state, yeah, we, we see a few of those ranch you know size type of um, operations and the and the tracks could be pretty sizable in scale but we just see a lot of those smaller ones also and so then when you look at over the, over the past say five or excuse me 10 years really time uh, appears to be a great equalizer between cropland pasture and all tracks all tracks is sort of a combination of everything in the blender. And that really amounts to about a 5% annual growth. But what you don't realize is how that five years is really, or excuse me, 10 years is performed in five-year increments. And so when you look at that, then you can look at sort of the changes over the first half of last decade, and then the second five years of that uh, past 10-year period. And you can see that we had a tremendous uh, performance uh, in the uh, cropland growing regions of the state. And those cropland values were a beneficiary of some rather strong commodity prices during the first five years of that period. Now we've had to give some of that value back um, in the past five years. Not a lot, nothing like what we experienced back in the mid to late eighties, but there was some uh, loss in equity and loss in wealth. Um, and there were some balance sheets that suffered more than others. Then when you look at the, uh, the pasture land side, I think we saw more of a steady growth. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, a slower growth in, in pasture land values, uh, statewide and even by region of the state, um, over the past five years, but it's been more consistent, uh, in, in terms of growth over the past, say, 10 years. And so, you know, it's interesting to look at the land utilization, how that impacts those uh, averages by region around the state. So then another way that I look at the cropland markets and pastures, look at the three year um, weighted averages. And that's uh, sort of a statistical procedure that I use in addition to those annual averages that tends to smooth out those year to year variations in those um, averages. And uh, so once again, you can see that uh, over the past couple years, uh, we've had some adjustments and, and some corrections in those cropland growing regions uh, in the state. Then in the pasture side, you can see that it's been fairly steady in the West, a lot of uh, livelihood type of purchases, uh, the rationale there or motivations. But in the eastern part of the state, uh, we see a lot of those smaller tracks, once again, I would say kicking in. And, uh, you know, we have uh, a number of those smaller tracks that are, I would call lifestyle operations. And uh, so we have a lot of these smaller operations where they might have a residence on that track, they may not, but there is some ag production, you know, received from that track but that operator or owner doesn't necessarily receive the, the, you know, their income predominantly, say, from that tract. Um, 
you know, most of the livelihood is really from off farm income. And uh, so the motivations to buy that track are a little bit different than those livelihood tracks of which, you know, we do see around the state, but uh, we just see a lot of these uh, smaller uh, part-time operations in the Eastern part of the state where they're running a few cows or horses, maybe they have a few goats or sheep, they put up a few round bales or square bales. And yes, they do derive some income from that, but that's not their primary source of income. It's helping to supplement their off-farm income and pay for some family living expense and that type of thing. And they may have some recreational interest in that parcel also. And so uh, once again, you can see how that's playing into the regionals or, you know, around the state. So, you know, where are the land markets headed from here? Uh, this little girl really doesn't have a clue and sometimes I don't either, uh, but you can get a few at least uh, clues from, oh, some other reports and visits around the state. And I think also you can sort of do the math a little bit in terms of what is, you know, what are the factors that are driving the markets? And it really boils down to a balancing act between, say, interest rates the non-farm investors, just how active are they um, from the metropolitan areas around Oklahoma City or Tulsa, or even moving up from, say, uh, North Texas. Um, and then what about commodity prices and those impacts on farm earnings? And what about debt levels and credit conditions? Support payments from, say, FSA or USDA in general. Uh, all of these factors uh, individually and sometimes in combination are driving the markets. And I'm going to focus a few comments here on the, in the next couple of slides, really on commodity uh, prices and also interest rates. Uh, because when it comes to trying to determine how much can I afford to pay or how much can I afford to bid for a parcel of ground, especially when it comes to from a livelihood standpoint and motivation, um, I'm thinking about, okay, what are those potential farm earnings? How productive is that piece of farm ground? And how much can I afford to pay for that farm ground today based on those expectations? And so it's a matter of really capitalizing those values. And so, you know, what do we really mean by capitalizing values? Well, it's a, it's a way that, you know, we're thinking about a present value of the earnings that you might expect to receive from an acreage, you know, that you own and operate um, for several years down the road. And it could be even on, on behalf of the heirs of that particular property. And so how do you quantify, you know, an income stream into a current value? Well, with certain, you know, assumptions opposed, you could think about for an income producing asset like farm ground, its value is really equaling those capitalized uh, revenues. And how do you do that? Well, you look at it from a sort of a formula here where you take those expected revenues divided by a capitalization rate. And that uh, interest rate, otherwise known as the capitalization rate, really converts those earnings into a current value. And so what does that cap value really represent? You can think of it as representing the time value of money for the next, say, 10 years, 20 years, even 50 years down the road. Well, estimating the profitability of farming is pretty tough, you know, from one year to the next, let alone thinking about it, you know, 50 years down the road. So instead, let's try to simplify the math and simplify sort of the, the income stream and look at it from a standpoint of, for instance, a perspective of a landlord who expects to receive a pretty reliable rent check, you know, every year could be the average of about $35 per acre from cropland in Western Oklahoma. So that takes care of the numerator uh, in that fraction and it takes care of the expected revenues. So then what do you do about the cap rate? Well, if you anticipate a world where the interest rates are going to be extremely low for a long period of time, then there are really fewer opportunities to earn a better return from other assets as opposed to farmland. And so you can adjust that cap rate or that interest rate pretty low to represent the current interest rate environment. And so in my next example, I'm going to use the 10-year treasury rate in terms of a financial instrument and that rate of return for that particular financial instrument so far in 2021. 
And uh, the returns on that, uh, the interest rates are about a percent and a half. Not very much. You know, it's kind of like a fixed, um, you know, income uh, type of instrument, but it's relatively risk free. But that's really been the treasury rate so far in 2021 so far. So if you were to invest like $2,400 into a 10 year treasury note, you would expect to receive like $35 for the next 10 years at a percent and a half money. And uh, so that's how I guess you can look at trying to determine or justify how much you can pay for an income producing asset such as farm ground. Now, when you look at the math, it becomes extremely sensitive to the numerator and denominator in those changes. If you increase the revenues, if you lower the interest rates, that increases the value. But the opposite is also true. So if you were to reduce or excuse me, the, uh, you know, increase the interest rates and it doesn't take a whole lot, um, it can really impact the value of that uh, asset. And so in this case, it's about 2.2%. It's about 63 basis points higher than where we were, you know, with the, the treasury rate in 2021. And this is really the average that that particular financial instrument has been offering over the past 10 years. And so once again, you can see how, well, higher interest rates as you might expect makes, um, you know, the, financing for an asset more expensive, okay, uh, dictates uh, more strict terms. And so you can see how that might impact your purchasing decision uh, going forward if you anticipate higher interest rates um, in the future. Now, I think uh, when you look at it from a standpoint of if you were to take that 2.2% money, you know, in sort of an interest rate environment, the only way you can really justify some higher prices really bid into the markets, especially on cropland values around in Oklahoma, is that, well, the buyers must be thinking of wheat prices higher than where, where they're at today, or at least higher than where we've been in the past. Now, in 2020, according to our report, uh, we had a lot of cropland in north central Oklahoma, about $1,900 per acre, which was pretty in, indicative of a lot of $5 wheat, you know, last year. At the first half of the year, we had, you know, wheat prices and the wheat markets were less than five. And then as we moved through the year, they were offering more than five. And then it was even closer to six uh, at the end of the year. But, uh, you know, if you anticipate higher wheat prices, you know, um, down the road, you know, you can be justified to bid more for that piece of farm ground. Okay, everything else equal at these interest rates. But now if you think about interest rates and their impacts on uh, farmland, you can see how it just doesn't take a whole lot of an increase in interest rates to, you know, really hammer down those land values. Now, I don't anticipate interest rates going up substantially. You know, they can't get much cheaper or lower. Uh, they can certainly increase. But I don't see much of a spike and I don't see much of a, a movement really in interest rates in the, uh, the near term, certainly, because uh, it's just the way the economy is now. We, we need to be operating in a low interest rate environment. And so it would have to take some you know, unanticipated uh, changes in the, uh, the economy to, for whatever rhyme or reason, uh, increase those interest rates. And of course, that would jeopardize uh, some of those uh, prices that are currently being paid uh, for farm ground and, and may rethink some uh, purchasing decisions if in fact uh, that were to uh, occur. But once again, I don't anticipate any major increase in those interest rates uh, down the road. So once again, if you anticipate you know, wheat prices closer to $7 to where we were in the first half of the last decade, okay, about 10 years ago. And we have a lot of $7 wheat today. If you anticipate a lot of that continuing down the road, and you're thinking about purchasing some wheat ground, well, that'll factor into your decision. You may be prepared to pay a little bit more for that piece of farm ground. 
but by the same token, if you think wheat prices are going to head in the other direction, because, you know, producers always, you know, produce themselves out of prosperity, right? You know, it's just a matter of time. But if you think that, you know, the $6 wheat is sort of that new norm, it's sort of the floor price, and we're going to kind of deviate a little bit from that, then, you know, we can be justified paying more for wheat ground than where we were in the past. And the same comes uh, into play for pasture ground around the state. If you're a cow-calf operator and producer, you know, you've been experiencing probably some tight operating margins in the last couple of years. You know, those profits have been squeezed just because of, uh, you know, uh, cow-calf uh, prices that have been less than stellar. But if we can increase uh, those returns uh, with some higher, say, calf prices going down the road, I think that will also provide some support to those pasture land markets and provide some positive price pressure on those markets, of course, going forward too. Interest rates, uh, you know how they've uh, been factored uh, and been been factored into the markets, um, not only in ag real estate, but also the residential markets. Um, it's been just wild and crazy. Uh, some call it stupid and crazy how, you know, the, the residentials have been operating in the last, uh, say, couple months, uh, certainly over the past year. And uh, it's a kind of a limited uh, supply. Uh, there's a lot of buyers lined up. And uh, you can say a little bit of the same about, um, you know, farm ground. Uh, certainly there's a, more of an interest in farm ground as of late, just because of these higher commodity prices that we're seeing. And uh, so when you talk about these uh, lower interest rates, and I don't see much of a movement uh, from those uh, interest rates that we're seeing very historically low, uh, that provides a lot of support to the markets. Also, I wanted to provide a sort of a quick uh, comparison of our reports and our findings with uh, USDA. And of course, once again, our, our studies are somewhat different in terms of, you know, the way that our numbers are compiled. But once again, uh, there are, you know, you might expect some differences and there are some differences uh, in our numbers versus USDA, not only in cropland, but we'll see pasture in a moment. But I think just as importantly, I wanted to see, you know, show that we do have some clues and some insights as to how the markets have performed so far in 2021. And at least according to USDA, those markets have been pretty strong, about 7% um, stronger uh, in terms of a, an appreciation uh, over the past year, at least according to uh, USDA NAS. And the same thing can be said uh, from the pasture line side, about 8%. And of course, here you can see a lateral shift uh, in our, you know, our numbers and our findings versus USDA. Once again, that's just because we have a, a lot of those smaller tracks that are driving that overall average uh, with our study. So also, uh, according to the um, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, they just re released a report on Friday that uh, was uh, sort of a uh, discussion of the ag economy within the 10th district of which Oklahoma is part of. And they released uh, you know, their findings on how much dry land cropland really has uh, performed uh, over the past say 12 months from the second quarter of 2020 to the second quarter of 2021. And there they saw something over 10% in terms of, a, of a, an appreciation. So I think the markets have been pretty strong so far in 2021. And I think uh, that trend will have a tendency to continue uh, for the remainder of this year. And so I guess that cuts to the chase in terms of summaries. Um, you know, we were remarkably steady and quite resilient in our markets in 2020 in Oklahoma. Uh, didn't really change a whole lot. And uh, the, num the numbers that are being shown uh, there really are pretty close to what uh, USDA NAS also did show. Now we did show a slight decline in our cropland prices and NAS had about a, oh, a percent or two uh, increase in their cropland, but you know, the pasture and overall all tracks were pretty, pretty similar. 
2021 values higher in the short term, no doubt about that. And I think beyond 2021, any or all of these uh, factors will influence those markets. And it's really hard to read just how much of an influence they will have. I think the biggest fly in the ointment is the potential headwinds from COVID and those variants that we're experiencing um, in our this country and really around the world. I think that will impact uh, the ag economy, certainly the uh, national economy as well as you know, the worldwide economy. And I think it's a situation that we're going to have to deal with and live with for a while. And I think everything else equal, that will apply some downwards pressure on the markets just because of that uncertainty that's uh, sort of hanging over our heads in terms of how bad can it get or how bad will it be? What will those impacts be? So that's something that uh, we'll just have to be aware of and uh, you know stay on top of, all right? So I wanted to emphasize to you that um, we do have a land values uh, website uh, with our department. It's basically been overhauled. We have a different appearance. Uh, hopefully it's, it's more visually appealing to the, the visiting publics. And um, I have basically, redone a lot of charts and a lot of tables. Hopefully they are looking a bit better than what they were in the past. Uh, so I would include uh, or at least encourage you to visit our website as a go-to source of information in addition to the other sources of land value information available from the Kansas City Fed and also USDA. All good sources of information of which we can make hopefully some better decisions. And I think once again, they're very complimentary of each other. So once again, thanks for being here. I know we all have to be somewhere, but I'm, I'm really glad that you uh, decided to join us today. And hopefully I gave you a little better understanding and insight as to you know, the movers and the shakers in the land value markets in Oklahoma, uh, where we've been, where we're at, where we might be uh, down the road. I would encourage you to check out the webinar survey there and, and fill it out. Let us know how we're doing. And I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if need be to answer any questions. But uh, short of that, once again, thanks for being here. Um, have a good rest of the day. I'll turn it back over to Brent. Thank you, Roger. Um, so I shared in the chat box, I shared a link to the land values website that Roger mentioned. I also shared a link to the webinar survey that he had, that you can see on the screen there. So you can click on either of those links. And as Roger mentioned, we do appreciate your feedback and helping us know how we're doing it and everything and helping us improve. And um, also I want to let everyone know that we have our next scheduled webinar for September 7th. It's also Tuesday at noon. And Dr. Daryl Peel will discuss prospects for raising cattle on wheat this year. And so that's our next scheduled webinar. I have set it up so people can ask questions to the chat. You can unmute yourself if you have a microphone and ask your question over microphone to Roger and he can get your questions answered. And if you don't have any at this present time, you can certainly uh, send me in a, you know, an email, give me a holler, give me a call, rattle my cage, and uh, I'll get back with you as soon as I can, and uh, we'll take it from there. But uh, once again, thanks for joining us today. Well, since it seems to be no questions, we will end the webinar now. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you on September 7th. Thank you.